My name is Jessica Rubalcaba. And I'm Ana Barraza. And today, with the support of our friends at United Healthcare, we are here with Dr. Lisette Sanchez and Tiffany De La Riva, licensed therapists, to demystify the mental health issues that affect our communities. Yes, depression, anxiety, and other mental health conditions that affect so many of us, and yet, we don't like to talk about it. So thank you, United Healthcare, for recognizing the challenges and empowering us all to have these sometimes difficult conversations. We have questions, and we're asking for an amiga. Okay, so we are here today to discuss mental health and you know how taboo it is in the Latino community, why it is that it's taboo, how we can start having these difficult conversations, not just with ourselves, but with our family members. And we asked our peers, audience, what mental health issues affect them the most. So we're excited to have you guys here. Yeah, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I wanted to become a therapist because when I was a little girl, I had separation anxiety. When I started pre-K, I like grabbed onto my mom's leg. I would, not, I would cry, I would not let go. And my parents, they didn't know what to do. And so they deferred to the teacher. And the teacher said, oh, take her to therapy, that will help her. That's when I realized there's a job, there's a career out there where yeah. you can help people, you can help mm. improve their quality of life, help mm -hmm. them just be better, be happier. And that's what initially drew me to the field. And as I continued on, I found that there was a lack of representation when it came yep. to gente, when it came to the Latina community. Yeah. And so I wanted to also bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. What about you? What drew you into the field? Yeah, and I think there's a running joke right now, right, amongst the mental health uh, providers that it's our trauma response. And I really oh. feel like that's pretty accurate, at least for me. It just came so second nature to want to be the person to provide a safe mm. space for other people, mm. to provide that nurturing care that maybe people don't have mm -hmm. in their own homes or in their own circles, right? Okay, ladies, let's start with an easy one. Intergenerational trauma. <laughs> it's funny, but actually we had an overwhelming amount of responses from our yeah. Fierce fam in this audience polling. What exactly is intergenerational trauma? So intergenerational trauma is a trauma that is passed down from one generation to the next, right? Yeah. Sometimes when we experience a trauma, it causes a significant shift in how we cope with situations. Yeah. And then all of these different behaviors are passed down to the next generation, right? So how you're socialized, what environments you're growing up in, what's going on there, so I got my grandma's issues, my mother's issues. Yeah. And they wonder and they wonder why, you know, I'm just like trying to take it easy here. Yeah, well, because now we want to rest, right? It's exhausting. <laughs> yeah. It's so exhausting to feel exactly. all of that. Um, pressure. So that's that's essentially just what it is, uh, yeah. but it impacts us in a lot of different ways. Yeah, different ways that it shows up. It can show up as depression, anxiety. And I think a couple of things that we could do that may be helpful is starting off with conversations like this, destigmatizing yeah. mental health, talking about the trauma that our parents and our grandparents endured. Um, and I think it also starts with what we want it to look like for future generations, right? So as a mom myself, I plan on instilling different coping skills with my son, mm. right? Yeah. Um, and this could look like having open communication, apologizing if something I did was inappropriate or wrong, right? Um, I think it starts off with conversations like that first and foremost. Yeah. And I feel like our generation, you know, who's the most equipped with the tools, we're like curious and we're learning and we want to break mm -hmm. these cycles. Like what are some coping skills that we can maybe teach our parents to kind of help them? Or teach you know? me, please, teach, <laughs> teach me something. Yeah, no, and I think it's important <laughs> we talk about how do we address it so that yeah. it doesn't continue to get passed on to generations, right? Because if we act like it's not there, it's going to get continued yes. to pass on to our kids and then their kids. No, absolutely. It's a lot of reflection. Yeah. We don't know what we want to change unless we have insight into what's going on with us. And so you can reflect through journaling, you yeah. can reflect through talking to trusted loved ones, you can reflect through speaking with a professional. Once you have that awareness and you can begin to notice, well, what is something that I'd like to change? Where do I start? And it's a lot of baby steps. You start small, right? Yeah. You are have experienced a way of being mm -hmm. and a way of existing for your whole lives. Mm -hmm. And now we're trying to change that. And so that comes to, that needs a lot of self-compassion. It's gonna, it's hard. It's hard to break cycles. And what you talked about journaling, because I feel like a lot of the times we do our own work and, mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the questions or journal prompts that you should be asking yourself? Because sometimes we don't even know what questions to ask. Like, we don't know where to start. Yeah, you know, I think in my work, I try to be very strength focused. And okay. so a lot of it is, and our reflections are like, okay, what is it that brings you joy? 
-hmm. And what stops you from being mm -hmm. able to feel that joy? And when we start to recognize, okay, what is what is what's stopping us? Those are some of our barriers. Mm -hmm. That might be one of the cycles that we're trying to break, right? Maybe what stops us from feeling joy is constantly feeling guilty mm -hmm. for putting ourselves first. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting that you brought up uh, the term joy and kind of diving into like your own mental health journey because that's not what I would, you know, it's, I, maybe that's like the that's misconception. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the misconception of it all too, right? Like it's supposed to be traumatic. It's supposed to be oh this. Um, and then also going into like the topic of depression. I know that that's something that's like really prevalent among the community and also super hard to talk about. In fact, someone uh, from our Fierce fam um, kind of elaborated a little bit about their experience and told us that, you know, when she's opened up to her mom about like, hey, I have depression. Her mom said, "It's okay. just be happy. You don't have depression. Just be happy. So how can we kind of talk about this with our family. I think it starts off with having conversations to normalize mm. depression, normalize anxiety, right? Um, and I think destigmatizing mental health, right? I think in a lot of Latino uh, families, it's kind of like taboo to say like, oh, mom, I think I have depression. Mom, I think I need to go to therapy because they say, you know, this is solo para los locos. That's limpiar. only, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Cleaning, clean. It's because you're bored. It's because you're yeah. bored, it's right? It's bored. Yeah, <laughs> that, or it could be misconceptions like, oh, you're just always in your bed. Like you need to get out of the house. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, people who suffer from depression physically cannot get out of their bedrooms, yeah. right? Um, so I think having conversations with people we trust um, and start opening up about us wanting to seek help outside the family. And I think that's another uh, thing that's taboo, right? Is in a lot of Latino mm -hmm. families, it's not okay to talk about things that go on in the family outside of the home, mm -hmm. right? That, that's really frowned upon. Mm -hmm. Something that helped me in the situation with my mom, um, I never realized that I had never asked her about her upbringing when I was going through a difficult time with her. And the more I learned about her and her relationship with her mother, the more sympathy I had mm -hmm. yeah. and realized they're learning too. They don't know that they can seek help or, um, so that gave me a little bit more permission to kind of step back and reevaluate the situation. Yeah. And. So, but I learned that through therapy. <laughs> and sometimes yeah. you can bring in some of those smaller tools that you learn. You might say, oh, you know what I have found that's really helping me when I get stressed, mm. mom, is, you know, going outside for a walk. Yeah. Maybe we can go on a walk together sometimes, yeah. right? And then you're sharing you're, coping skills. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're sharing, you're teaching the coping skills. And so then eventually when you're ready to share the diff whatever feels difficult to share, you know that we model, we model behaviors yeah. and we can yes. help people learn through modeling. One of the things that Fierce has addressed before in our Latina community is the eldest daughter syndrome. Oh my God. Can you help us understand what that is? Please, please yeah. help us. <laughs> okay, again, as I'm an eldest daughter, and I'm like, how many eldest daughters do we have at the table right now? Yeah. Yeah. I'm an only child. <laughs> that counts, the <laughs> oldest. You know what Actually, above. technically, yeah. I think yeah, let's technically, we're a table of eldest daughters. daughters. Yes. yes. But I don't know if we're going to be so excited about oh, this once no, we talk no, about no, it. No, what, no. what we're talking about. Yay for me. The syndrome. <laughs> No, uh, so eldest daughter syndrome, so it's a pop culture term that encapsulates this experience that many eldest daughters may have in common, right? A lot of different characteristics that we may share because we're eldest daughters. So mm -hmm. situations like, you know, because we're the eldest, we're naturally put into a caregiver role. Uh, again, and because we're eldest daughter, because this is not the same experience for eldest sons. Oh my God. Um, yeah. <laughs> So uh, different characteristics. So like the the caregiving, um, taking on more household responsibilities, mm -hmm. um, higher level of expectation when it comes to just just anything that they're doing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Being proper. Um, something that I think a lot of Latinas probably have heard a lot is this phrase that's calladita te ves más <gasps> bonita. Yeah. Yeah. You all Absolutely. know what I'm saying, right? Oh, so, yes. Mm -hmm. All these daughters, it's like you're taught to be subservient, right? You're taught to be more self-sacrificing. Very early on, the first daughters are called very mature for their age, uh, mm -hmm. very developmentally advanced. And it's like when we kind of reflect, like, hmm, where did that come from? It's yeah. kind of like, well, at a very early age, we were taught that it was our responsibility to babysit. It was mm -hmm. our responsibility to take care of the household chores while both parents worked, right? It was also a responsibility to be el ejemplo para los niños, yes. right? Which means you have to set the example for the kids because they're watching you. Mm -hmm. um, and so it just sets so many expectations, so many roles, so many responsibilities at such a young age.
And going back to what you said about also the phrase that most of us kind of grew up hearing, calladita te ves más bonita. Yes. You know, one of the founding pillars of Fierce was calladitas no more because we're breaking that, right? Yeah. So that's a founding uh, belief of the platform. It's a reason of why we're all here. We're kind of getting rid of the uh, the literal taper on our mouth and kind of having these difficult conversations. So yes, you know, in calladitas no more also comes, you know, advocating for ourselves and we've been taught to say yes and to be the person for, you know, our family needs. But how do we say no? How do we advocate for ourselves, set those boundaries and not feel guilty about it? Because they're kind of two separate things, but it's hard to, you know what I mean? They're just intertwined. Right, right. And I think to start off with, right, I think it's really important that we define what boundaries are and mm. what the purpose of setting boundaries are, right? And by setting boundaries, it doesn't mean that we're going to be able to change other people, right? Mm -hmm. But what it does mean is that we're able to shift our focus to what am I in control of in this situation, mm -hmm. right? I've set this expectation, I've set this boundary with this person, and you know what? They're not listening to me. What's going to change? What can change is how, how often we spend time with them, mm -hmm. um, how close our relationship is. Um, how much energy we allow certain relationships to take up in our lives, and even what events we're willing to commit ourselves to, right? Like if mm. we don't want to go somewhere, you don't have to go, yeah. right? Mm. And I think, um, especially in the Latino community, there's a lot of pressure of like, you have to come to all family gatherings. Yeah. But the yeah. truth is like, we don't have to, yeah. we don't have to. You know, I was thinking about something else that you said, Jess, you talked about, how do we not feel guilty? Yeah. <laughs> how do we yeah. stop feeling guilty? And I think that when, when we're talking about guilt, we have to reframe how we think about it. Okay, I'm feeling some kind of way because I'm trying something new. Right. It's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. Right. Uh, especially thinking about your intentions when we're setting boundaries. All of the boundaries we're setting, they're to deepen our connections with the people we love. They're not to separate from them. When we can connect with someone in a way that feels most authentic to us, like, you know, if I'm more introverted, I only have a certain social battery. Oh, yeah. And I can't, like, interact more than that. And mm -hmm. if you try to push me past that, you're going to get a grumpy, yeah. like, individual. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to be here. Who's going to tener la mala cara or whatever they say. Yeah. It's like, oh. But if I set the boundary and say, you know, I'm only available and around during business hours. Actually, after that, I need to decompress. I'm just not available. Yeah. And then you only interact during the time when you have the most energy. Mm -hmm. Then you're able to connect on a deeper level as opposed yeah. to. So I think we want to think about boundaries, like, like Tiffany mentioned, it is how we respond versus react, but it is also to deepen our relationships yeah. with the people we care about. So being mindful that it's not, it's not to separate. Yeah. I think the guilt, yeah. usually for me at least, it comes at the beginning when you're first putting that, trying to set, trying the to set the boundary because what I realize happens is I'm breaking a perception of others half of me. So they're used to me being available mm -hmm. and now I'm not as available. Or they're used to me being, you know, very people pleasing and now I'm kind of not and putting my foot down a little bit. And so I think it's just like, oh, it's just the perception they have of me of being like, well, I'm, they're they're gonna think I'm this or that I'm changing or that I don't love them as much or that, you know. Mm -hmm. We're kind of conditioned to feel guilty, mm -hmm. right? Like it's our responsibility to be readily available to everyone mm -hmm. at all times, right? Mm -hmm. And so again, I think once we start feeling guilty is reminding ourselves, what's the purpose of this boundary that I set? What's the change I'm looking for, yeah. right? And I think, um, when we are feeling guilty, it's okay to sit with that discomfort, right? Like I always encourage that, like sit with the discomfort. Mm. It's, it's a normal feeling, right? We, we experience anger, we experience, experience sadness. Guilt is a completely normal emotion too. And so like, let's sit with that, let it write out, practice some self care and continue with the consistency of setting the boundary. So like sit it. with the discomfort literally applies to yeah. everything. Right, because a lot of things are uncomfortable, yeah. especially when it's our first time doing it. Yeah. yeah. Another member of our fierce community wrote how scarcity mindset can lead to hoarding, mm -hmm. adding that her grandmother didn't have a pair of shoes until she was 17, so she holds on to things because she never had much before. 
I think a lot of us could relate to, right? Going to our grandparents' house or even our own parents' house, opening up the cabinets and seeing expired condiments, right? Yes. Or even like bread that's already stale. And they're yeah. like, oh no, todo ya está bueno. Like it's still good, we could eat it, yeah. you know? No, no desperdices la comida, right? Mm. And I think we all have been raised with that mentality of like, don't be wasteful, be grateful. We worked really hard to buy this loaf of bread, yeah. right? And I think it all stems from when our parents and grandparents were raised, right? They didn't have the same resources we did, right? Yeah. Where if something doesn't taste as good or fresh, we could just go buy another loaf of bread. It wasn't the same circumstances for them. Well, I think with scarcity mindset, there's a lot of fixed mindset as well, right? The scarcity, it's like uh, there may never be enough. And then fixed mindset of things will always be this way and there's nothing that I can mm -hmm. change about this or there's nothing that will make me want to change, right? So I will always be in scarcity. Things will never change. And even when I see that there are resources. What tools can we pull to kind of teach them, hey, that's, you know, the wrong mindset, like let's move them from a fixed to a growth or what can we do? Affirmations, right? Mm -hmm. We spend a majority of our time in our own brains, in our own thoughts, mm -hmm. right? So let's shift that mindset to more positive affirmations, right? Mm -hmm. For example, I am worthy of change. I am worthy of healing and growth, right? I am enough and my worth is not dependent on my belongings mm -hmm. and personal property. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So while we're talking about affirmations, I wanted to share my favorite affirmation yeah. with you all. It's not what I say out loud that determines my life. It's what I whisper to myself that has the most power. But how does that work when like you're kind of anxious <laughs> and you tell yourself a lot of things? Well, that's the thing. Be aware, like when you're anxious, what are you, you're giving all of those anxious thoughts, mm -hmm. all of the power, right? Yeah. And your thought could be instead of, what if everything goes wrong? It's yeah. like, what if everything worked out? What if everything turned out exactly the way I want it to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I love that. Write that one down. Everything <laughs> is being what recorded. What are you whispering to yourself? <laughs> and I think another great suggestion is maybe seeking professional help, right? Finding a therapist or psychologist. Yeah. I feel like it's so scary. Like a lot of people in our community because it's been so taboo for so long, like they don't know what to expect out of it. Like therapy can seem really daunting and something really scary. So um, how can we communicate to family members or loved ones like what they can expect out of a therapy session? And I think first and foremost, right, and I encourage it with people who are coming to me to seek uh, services too, is I encourage everyone to schedule at least two maybe three consultations with different therapists. That mm. way you can find someone who's like the best fit for you, right? Yeah. Uh, having a consultation with them, asking them all the questions on what they specialize, how long they've been doing it for. And then as long as you feel comfortable with them, then scheduling an appointment with them, mm. right? And I think the biggest thing too is I think, um, is reminding yourselves, right? That even if you start therapy with one therapist, it doesn't mean you have to stick with them, right? Like mm -hmm. if it's not a good fit, you need to go with someone who is the right fit. And you yeah. know, we at least, right? We don't take it personally if someone's like, hey, you know, I think I need to find another therapist, right? Because we too want you to make the most out of the space. Yeah. Yeah, and that therapist-client relationship, that fit that we talk about, it's very important. In fact, like all the research that they've done on what makes therapy the most effective, it's the relationship between the client and the therapist. Yeah, and then once you start therapy, I think it, knowing that it is a confidential space, right? I think in a lot of these communities, there's a lot of fear around what will people think of me, right? Like what if people knew that I had these thoughts, that I have these feelings? Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of shame around the emotions that people feel. And so knowing that therapy is confidential, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's, there's very few reasons for when we break confidentiality and that's only if there's a concern of the safety your safety or welfare or the safety or welfare of a vulnerable population. Yeah. Otherwise, everything you say, you know, like <laughs> stays between us. I think what I've gotten when I tell people, oh, I'm in therapy. Oh, what's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, nothing. I'm just working on myself. OK, so in addition to therapy, like what can we do to practice self-care? First and foremost, right, I think a lot of people experience this guilt of taking time to practice self-care, right? Mm -hmm. It feels like super like guilty <laughs> or like we have to earn it. Yeah, right? I hear yes. a lot of people saying like, oh, I don't think I like deserved it this week. Like I didn't mm -hmm. earn it. And I think that all stems from basing our uh, value or worth on productivity, yeah. which mm -hmm. isn't fair for us either, right? Because we do work really hard. And even when we don't, we still need to take those breaks, right? Mm -hmm. well, it's the same thing we talk about when we're talking about why we need self-care. You want to pour into your own cup so that you can pour into other people's cups. Yeah. You want to take care of your yourself, your soul, your being, whatever term to really help kind of push that 
message forward and be able to focus on what I'm doing now isn't selfish. It's so that I can actually be a better sibling, uh, a better like parent, a better spouse. Uh, uh, you know, I can show up more. When we talk about self-care, it's not always like these really big, like it doesn't have to be a full weekend. Sometimes it's these mindful moments of, I'm feeling a little bit overwhelmed. Let me remove myself from this, even in this space. Like, you know, even if you live in a small space, like a studio, uh, yeah. you know, it's like, maybe let me just step outside for a second, or let me go stand mm -hmm. by a window if going outside doesn't, isn't like, accessible for you. But just how do you shift, like literally your space a little bit to help shift your mood. All the little things add up to a yeah. bigger amount of energy. When I say small moments, I think five minutes. Five mm. minutes of even of stillness, five minutes in your transition from one space to another. You're coming home from work. You know that there's so much that you want to get done at home as yeah. soon as you get home. Give yourself those extra five minutes. Go inside when you feel ready. That reset makes the biggest difference in your mood mm. as you end your night. Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely felt a little bit of anxiety when I'm like, I'm exhausted, I want to take a nap, but I have, I feel in my head I have like so many things I got to get done. Right. But you can't show up as your best person to no, take care exactly. of those things and if you're way, not taking right. care of yourself. Yeah. 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 Jeff gets it. It's hard. No, and I'm aware of it. I know, and, and I'm like guilty. I'm sitting and like, in the yeah. discomfort every time. I'm like, no, I'm going to rest. <laughs> you're going to close my eyes, I'm even if I'm not falling asleep. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Tiffany and Dr. Lissette, for being here with us today. I know I learned so much, and I feel I, like I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure our fierce familia did as well. So, huge shout out to our friends at United Healthcare for being there for what matters and empowering this important conversation. Yes, and check out uhc.com/healthymind for more mental health resources. Hasta la próxima. Adiós.